I want to simply introduce uh, Danny Whitesurm from the World Wide Web Consortium, who does policy for uh, the the baseline of, of our internet, uh, the web. Uh, we have a panel here which is, which is taking the theme of before we get into all of the policy discussions and problems we've got to solve, what is the state of the net and how should we think about the state of the net as we go forward both in measuring, uh, dealing with policy but also trying to think on, on uh, in, as we go along about how uh, we measure success in terms of the health of the net. Danny Weitzner. Thanks very much, Jerry. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. It's really an honor. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to see that this conference has gotten off to what I hope is the first of, of a number of years of, of this conversation to, to try to get us all thinking about uh, what the state of the net is today and, and, and what we might hope it would be in the future. Um, I thought I'd start just very quickly with a little um, uh, memory jog for, for those of us who have been doing this for a while. Um, I want to just remind you of some things that, that were said about the Internet in hopeful tones um, um, roughly 10 years ago. Um, see if you can, you can remember who said these things. Um, Here's the first one from 1994. The Information Society has the potential to improve the quality of life of the world's citizens, the efficiency of our social and economic organizations, and to reinforce cohesion. Martin Bangemann, 1994, uh, the Information Society report. Um, you'll all recognize this. The Internet is a far more speech-enhancing medium than print, the village green, or the mails. The Internet may fairly be regarded as a never-ending worldwide conversation. Who was that? Someone here who should know who that was. Judge Dalzell in Philadelphia in the CDA trial. Um, and, and my favorite one, most relevant to this organization, finally there's something that both Democrats and Republicans can agree on. It's time to get Congress online for the 21st century. That was, uh, that was uh, from, from our distinct, the distinguished chairs of, of this Internet Caucus uh, sent to a whole number of Internet news gr groups uh, announcing the creation of the Internet Caucus in 1996. Um, so with, with your mind focused a little bit back there, we, ha we have a, a very distinguished and thoughtful panel who are going to talk with us a little bit about uh, what people's experience of the net is today, uh, what's, what's working, are expectations uh, being met, uh, are there gaps that need to be filled, are people doing unexpected things uh, with the net that we really ought to be paying attention to. Uh, we're going to hear uh, short uh, opening remarks from, <clears throat> from each of our three speakers. I'm going to uh, tell you who they are, but I'm going to leave to you uh, the task of reading their, their bios uh, if you want to know more about them. Um, and and I, I'm just going to pose a couple of short questions to each of them. We'll talk a little bit amongst ourselves, and, and, and you should uh, uh, think about questions that you may have for them. And, and towards the end of the session, we'll have time for, uh, for, for questions from the audience. So I want to begin uh, with, with Lee Rainey. Lee is the executive director of the Pew Center on the Internet and American Life. Uh, and, and Lee um, brings a reporter's and editor's eye to uh, looking at uh, uh, really quantitative questions uh, about how people in their lives today are actually using uh, the Internet uh, as opposed to perhaps how we think they might be or should be or ought to be. Um, so, so, Lee, w w what do you have to tell us about um, uh, what people are doing with the net on a day-to-day -day basis? How is it, it changing people's lives? It's an honor uh, for me to be here when the Pew Charitable Trusts uh, decided to fund our nonprofit and nonpartisan agency without uh, an agenda. Uh, they had meetings like this in mind as the pinnacle of the kind of uh, way that our work might be used. So thank you, uh, Jerry and Danny, for having us here. I thought I'd run uh, through something that Jerry's always been pressing me to do. What's the state of the net? Well, I'm not going to give that kind of information, but I can tell you a lot about the state of the net population. And there are six sort of policy-relevant facts to, to keep in mind as you're thinking about uh, the Internet. The first is Internet use is the norm in America now. 61% of American adults, 84% of American teenagers use the Internet. They expect to find, and this is a big change in attitude from the pre-21st uh, uh, century, uh, right around 2000, expectations shifted on the net. Now, instead of it being a novelty, it's a utility and quite functional in their lives, people expect to find 
the uh, up-to-date news that they are seeking online, the government information and services that they want online, the health information and services they want, the products and services they want, increasingly the people that they want to connect with. They expect that other people like them are using the internet and have email addresses. And finally, we never asked about this, but I'm sure it's true, people expect to find the communities they want to uh, join online or they expect to be able to use the internet to form the communities that they want online. Policy fact number two is that the internet population has basically been dead in its tracks since the fall of 2001. Right after the 9-11 attacks, probably partly related to the economic downturn then, perhaps related to the saturation point of the, uh, of the internet population, we have not seen significant growth. Uh, somewhere between 57% and 63% keep answering our surveys since then that they use the internet. About half of those who do not use the internet, 75 million people do not use the internet, about half of them say they never intend to use it. They don't want it, they don't need it, they sometimes don't have the resources to be able to afford it, but they're also very wary of the technology and the online environment itself. They believe the press reports about the internet that it's full of predators and bad people and stalkers and pornography, and a lot of people, particularly old people, say, why in the world would I want to invite that into my life? The final thing that we know about them is that they often don't know what's available online. They know those bad things, but they don't know that they can get up-to-date health information, get the news that they want, and find um, stuff that's directly related and instrumental potentially for their lives. The third thing is that the growth of spam and probably the growth of spyware has affected the online environment. We learned uh, last year that about a quarter of internet users say they are using the internet less because of the volume of spam and the nature of spam that is coming into their life. We're getting a new reading on that now. We're working with the CDT and other organizations to do some spyware work, but it's quite clear there's been a slight dip in the online population since the uh, sort of fall of 2000. It might just be statistical um, noise, but it also is, is true that it coincides with the rise of uh, spyware as, as a problem in the online environment. There are nine, policy fact number four, there are nine ways to look at digital gaps in the world which have persisted even as the growth of the online population certainly has been uh, evident since the uh, mid-90s. Age is the most intractable part of the digital divide. 25% of those who are 65 years and over use the internet. 85% of those who are under age 30 use the internet. It is a persistent long-term gap. As I say, many old people say, see no reason to be online and it's a, it's a hard sell with them. But there are also gaps related to employment status. The single greatest predictor of being an internet user in this country is being a college student. And this, uh, one of the worst, uh, or one of the, the lowest predictors of being um, an internet user is being a widower or being retired. Uh, a third strong factor relates to educational attainment. If you've got a graduate degree or a college degree, you're much more likely to be online than someone who has a high school diploma. Obviously, income relates to the digital divides. Those who come from high-income households are much more likely to be online than those from moderate incomes. Race and ethnicity is, is the typical way we talk about the digital divide, but it's not the, a primary factor. But it is true that African Americans and, and Spanish-speaking Latinos are much less likely to be online than white Americans. Uh, community type matters, rural Americans are not as likely to be online as rural and suburban Americans. Disability is probably the second most influential factor in, in the digital divide. If you have a major disability, you are much less likely to be online than someone who doesn't have disabilities. Language is an important one. Those who do not speak English in this country are much less likely to be online than, the, than those who do. And then there's a sort of non-demographic psychographic that's really important and shows up almost worldwide. If you have high levels of trust, if you have great expectations about the future, if you have a sense of efficacy uh, in your life, you are much more likely to be online than those who have less hope and have less sense that they can control their destiny. The policy fact number five is that it's a fluid online population. This is not a monolithic population and it is not a linear story. People just don't march up a preordained curve in their internet use. The single most surprising fact that we keep encountering in our data is that, remember those 75 million pe of people do not use the internet. 20% of those live in households with an internet connection. They say they do not use the internet, other members of their family do, 
but they do not. Now, sometimes they're secondary internet users. They have another member of the family send and receive email for them. They have other members of the family do information searches for them, but they do not consider themselves online. And even in the online population, somewhere between 25% and 40% of current internet users say that at one point in time or another in their online life, they dropped offline for a significant amount of time. So there is a lot of churn in the online population. The sixth and final policy relevant point is that broadband growth is pretty strong in America. It's not as great as in other countries, but now 55 million Americans have broadband at home. Over 60% of internet users have broadband somewhere in their life, either at home or at work. And broadband users are substantially different and more enthusiastic internet users than dial-up users. They do more online, they spend more on time online, they perform more activities online, they port over to the, uh, their online life things that they might have done on offline things online. The, the, a classic example of that is once you get a broadband connection, you probably move your computer to a public place in your house, more than a private place, and you begin to bookmark things like weather sites and recipe sites, and you start sending your other members of your family instant messages instead of leaving them post-it notes on their bedroom doors. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the three metrics I would hold up to you, uh, Jerry has asked us to think about um, where should we think about being a year from now to show whether progress has been made. The metric number one would be just higher awareness of all the great stuff you can do online. A significant uh, uh, deterrent to people who are not online is they just don't know. A second thing would be more users. Uh, you are not going to grow the broadband population very much more dramatically until you get more dial-up users, and that's the population that has stopped growing. The route to broadband in this country for all of the hope about wireless uh, broadband, maybe uh, allowing some communities to leapfrog internet use, is through dial-up. Broadband users need some time and experience and familiarity with the online world before they'll go to broadband. So more users in general would be one, another metric. And the final thing would be higher levels of trust. There is a, a growing backlash to the spam and spyware problems uh, that is, is, is deterring people or inhibiting some of the stuff they do online. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Uh, and, and I'd encourage all of you to, to have a look at Lee's website. Uh, what's, what's the? PewInternet.org. I've, I've thrown up a presentation, uh, a, a PowerPoint with lots of data on it. If you go to the presentations part of, uh, of our site, the top report there will be a ton of data. It, it makes me worse than the rain man. I can spit these numbers out all day long. Uh, but that it, it's uh, material about what people are doing online in all sorts of realms, not only. Uh, all your reports are online. All, all our reports are online, yeah. Th thanks very much, Lee. So um, Richard Adler, uh, uh, Richard's the, the um, head of uh, organization CivicNet, which he'll tell us about. Um, Richard, what is, uh, uh, what is all this doing for civic life? Uh, is we, we, we've heard from Lee that, that broadband is coming relatively uh, aggressively. Uh, is that true? Is that going to change the way people interact as, as groups in, in communities? Uh, are we going to have the convergence that everyone has talked about uh, uh, through, through this broadband platform? Well, uh, some simple questions. Yeah, well, Lee's, Lee has uh, lots of data, uh, actual data. Uh, Peter's going to have some actual data. I, I just have some thoughts. Uh, uh, oh, I th had some interesting quotes. Uh, uh, Dan had some interesting quotes about the Internet. My very favorite quote about the Internet, the most incisive observation that I've ever heard about the Internet, came from uh, Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the Media Lab up at MIT. And in a conversation with me once, he said, uh, the only phenomenon that he's ever encountered where hype and understatement walk hand in hand is the internet. It's just a lovely statement. Uh, and it's so true. And uh, you know, one of the, I, well, I think one of the things that we struggle with is how do you sort out the hype from the understatement? Uh, and you know, the reasons why that is true. I mean, sir, and as, as we just heard, you know, in little more than a decade, the internet went from being this very exotic thing way off in a corner to something that's really now mainstream in the middle of American life, used by a majority. And not only is it, is it uh, growing, but it's also continuing to evolve. I mean, one thing that's about interesting about the internet is I think it's still in its early, early stages, that the technology, applications, uses continue to evolve uh, that extend the utility of the internet. And that where, they're com where it's coming from, which is, which is interesting, is still, by and large, not corporate R&D labs but from garages, from startups, and from dorm rooms. Um, and that's very hopeful. Uh, 
I want to really touch on, on two main themes. I want to talk a little bit about convergence and then a little bit about civic life. Um, the, the idea of convergence is, is certainly not a new idea. In fact, 20, more than 20 years ago, the great scholar of communications, Ithiel de Solapool, also from MIT, wrote about the, con quote, convergence of, of modes that is blurring the lines between media. And he made a useful distinction between two kinds of conversion. Convergence. First of all, different services that were previously carried by different physical media end up being carried in a single medium. For example, cable, which started out originally as a means of distributing television signals to places that didn't get over-the-air reception, and then uh, became a mechanism for pay television, and then it started carrying the internet, and now it's getting into the telephony business. So one medium that takes on more functions. And then the second form of convergence Services that had previously been carried by a single medium then get distributed through several other media. And think about television, which started out as a broadcast and then was uh, carried by cable and then by satellites, and now you can buy you know, uh, uh, full seasons of television programming on DVD and watch them over and over again. So the result of this convergence is that companies, in fact whole industries that previously had nothing to do with each other, find themselves competing or or collaborating to develop opportunities that lie on the boundaries between their traditional domains. And it's really the internet, because it is so all-encompassing, that has accentuated, accelerated, and intensified this pace of convergence. And really what it's being driven by is what I call the digitization of everything. And so Senator said early, it's all ones and zeros. It's all bits. And once you're dealing with bits, you know, whether it's a, a news report, uh, a credit report, or a, or a Beethoven symphony doesn't make any difference. The key factor, I want, the point that I really want to make, the key factor that really is gating the issue of convergence and really what is causing the friction in the system isn't technology, but the fact that what is converging are vastly different industries, each with its own worldview, with its own paradigm, its own history, its own economic models, legal and regulatory structure, its own cultures. And really, that's where the difficulty is. Let me just give you a couple of examples um, of three different paradigms that are, that are coming together. And you can see it in this conference, by the way. The first is what I call the communications paradigm, exemplified by the telephone industry. Historically, large regulated monopolies. You know, I can remember the day when AT&T was the largest company in the world. Maybe about to disappear, but it, it, it was. The goal was a high level of service, universal service. Competition was a fairly alien notion. And th these were industries that were, were regulated. And they were, their basic goal was simply to link people together to communicate. There was really no content. They were common carriers. Second is what I call the information or the computing paradigm. It's based on enabling people to access, manipulate, and disseminate data or information. This is centered psychically in Silicon Valley, hardware and software. And because this industry is based on Moore's Law, it's one that has evolved and changed with incredible dynamism. And it's one that's had little regulation. And the computer industry is generally viewed that technology moves much faster than uh, legal or regulatory systems can and has really tried to avoid it rather than deal with it. And then third, completely different paradigm, it's what I call entertainment paradigm, which is based on creating content, generally produced by a relatively small number of creative producers and distributed to large audiences. It's a hit-driven business. Uh, also been relatively lightly regulated except uh, for over-the-air broadcasting because they use the public airwaves, kind of a quaint notion these days, I think. And, you know, the issue of indecency is the one that has been uh, the centerpiece there. If you look at the, who's sponsoring this conference, and this is, you know, something I'd put together beforehand, but it's very interesting because you've got Verizon and MCI representing the communications paradigm. You've got Microsoft and RSA representing the communications, uh, the computing world, and then RIAA representing the world of entertainment. And all of these coming from their own traditions. There are other paradigms as well. The publishing paradigm, books, magazines, and newspaper, each with its own culture. Retailing, financial services. And as I say, what the internet really does is represent a kind of overarching paradigm that intersects and possibly, potentially, subsumes all of these, but it's fundamentally different. And I think this is really where the paradox is. With the internet, the thing that is so interesting and, 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 and complicated about the internet is that it has no owners, it has no real industry structure. 
It really exists only as a set of agreements among people to exchange and interconnect. And so there is no real representative of the Internet as such. So Richard, with that, I'm going to interrupt you, okay. if you'll forgive me. Um, we're going to turn to Peter Lewis, who's going to tell us about a little bit about the, the business of this non-existent business, uh, which, which I think is, uh, I guess, one of those Negroponte-type paradoxes. Um, uh, uh, Pete, Pete Lewis is a senior editor at uh, Fortune magazine. Is that your title right? Yeah. Um, uh, and is really a longtime uh, observer of, of both the industry and, and the policy space uh, um, back from when he was at the New York Times and before. And the amazing thing that I find about Pete is he managed to do all these different things and stayed right in Austin, Texas for years and years, which I think is uh, quite, quite brilliant, uh, and I suppose a sign of the times. Uh, so, so Pete, uh, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us your thoughts about whether the, the economic potential of, of the internet really has been realized. Did, was the bubble bursting just kind of a, a blip, uh, or, or was it a, a disaster that we still haven't quite dug out from, or, uh, and, and is there life after that? First of all, thanks, Danny and uh, Jerry, for inviting yet another Texan to Washington, D.C. Uh, seems like you have plenty of them here. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a reporter for the New York Times coming up to Washington during the first Bush administration and trying to get some sense of how well the technology had been integrated into the political structure here. I went to visit the vice president's office at the time and uh, find out what sort of a computer he used. This was Dan Quayle. And I talked to his chief of staff who said, oh yes, you know, he, he does have a computer on his desk. It's an old IBM PC. It's a hand-me-down from the agriculture department. And I thought, well, that's okay. I said, uh, is it connected to any sort of a network around here? He goes, no, it's just a standalone on his desk. And I go, well, what's he use it for? He goes, well, electronic mail. And <laughs> I said, really? And he goes, yes, he has to be ready to receive messages from the president. And uh, I thought, boy, are we in trouble. And then I come here to a conference like this uh, so many years later, and it's certainly much more encouraging to see so many people uh, interested in the technology and in the policies behind it. Um, I remember also being out in Silicon Valley in 2000, right after the, uh, the bubble began to pop. And I talked to a leading venture capitalist, and I said, you know, how bad is this going to get? And he said, stay alive till 2005. And that was the mantra. That was the measure of success. If they could keep things going until 2005, he predicted, things would start to turn around. And I think he may be right. You know, we're looking around the internet economy right now and we're seeing things like the Google IPO, uh, which certainly uh, harkens back to the old bubble days. We see others poised for IPOs in the tech industry, like Wayport. It's an Austin, Texas company that provides wireless internet access to all of the McDonald's and many of the airports that you guys visit. You look at uh, uh, not only that, but companies like Dell, also in my hometown, which uh, is well known for making computers, but uh, is also a tremendous web power. If you look in terms of sales of consumer electronics, things like uh, software and, and MP3 players, Dell ranks number three in the country behind Best Buy and Circuit City. So it's really transforming companies. On another level, uh, just as uh, Lee suggested, you know, the, the net has so insinuated itself into everyday life that it's kind of hard to measure what its impact is on the economy. Uh, any more than we would say, well, you know, what's the impact of the telephone on, on the economy? Uh, we no longer think of the network behind the things that we do any more than we say, I'm going to make a call on the telephone switch network. We say, you know, I'm going to make a call. And these days, uh, you know, it was interesting to uh, hear the senator from Alaska say VoIP as if it was, you know, just sort of a standard uh, term. Uh, those sorts of things are, are changing so fast. We, uh, we make a call, we send email, we look up something on Google, we buy something on eBay. Uh, if you're under 30, you uh, chat or instant message and, and those things. And you don't really think about what's behind it. Uh, you know, what is, uh, what is the net? I guess that's one of the major questions I'd like to, to hear defined. Uh, you know, what is the net? Is it just our internet? Is it the web? Is it telephone calls? Is it wireless, uh, you know, cable systems? We're going to have to uh, sort all of that out. Uh, one last thing. Uh, in order to determine the state of American 
of proficiency with the internet, I decided to go to South Korea, which is widely regarded as an information superpower. Now, a decade ago, South Korea was, the economy was really in the tank. It was one of the, uh, the lowest economies in all of Asia. At the time, they made a commitment as a country to become an information superpower and to focus all of their future economic growth on the Internet and on broadband. They now have the highest penetration of broadband in the world, with the exception of Iceland, which uh, is sort of a unique case. Uh, all of the numbers you heard about broadband penetration in the United States uh, are impressive in terms of growth, but you have to understand that what we define as broadband is not what they define as broadband. What we have as broadband today doesn't even show up on their radar screens. The typical Korean customer gets speeds of 10, 15, 20 megabits per second versus the one to one and a half megabits per second that you get on your local cable system or DSL service. Here's some things that uh, I picked up on this last trip to Korea. Internet penetration is 70%. Only 3% of those are dial-up connections. 96% of people under the age of 20, and in fact 95% of people under the age of 30, use the Internet on a regular basis. They use it about uh, an average of 10 to 12 hours a week. The government has just increased R&D spending by 9% over 2004, and they've elevated the science minister's status to the third deputy prime minister. In essence, they're saying science and R&D is the future of this country. They're moving toward an internet of things rather than an internet of people. RFID tags are, are planned to be installed in just about anything you can imagine, replacing barcodes on things in stores. In order to do that, in order to handle that traffic, they're accelerating their plans to move to a next generation internet called IP version 6. Uh, we're on IP version 4 here. Um, I don't believe there is an IP version 5, but uh, in any event, they're, they're really already thinking about the next thing. They're already devising cell phones that have RFID scanners in them, these little chips that emit radio signals so you can point it at a movie poster that has an RFID chip in it and download the trailer onto your video phone. You can go into the grocery store and, and uh, see a package of kimchi and determine its half-life, you know. Something like that. 300 uh, years. Yes, exactly. Uh, they're moving towards something, a homegrown standard called Ybro. We have Wi-Fi here in the United States, and we know about it. They have Ybro, which is wireless broadband or portable internet. This allows you to get broadband speed internet on a mobile device as you're traveling on the car at up to 60 clicks an hour. And uh, it even works down in the subways and, and other places like that. So it's a completely mobile internet. In addition to that, 40% of Korean cell phone users now use wireless internet regularly. 62% of those are in their 20s. 84% of those are in their teens. Let's get some exercise here. How many of you here are under 20? Okay. We just don't get what's going on out there. Uh, it's very difficult for people who are over 40 to really understand the scope of the change that's going on in the net right now. Satellite digital media broadcasting is big in Korea. By May, there are going to be 14 video channels and 24 audio channels, and that's DVD quality video and CD quality audio that can be broadcast to mobile devices. Japan has already launched those services, but uh, Japan has chosen to put it into automobiles, uh, whereas the Koreans are going into mobile handsets. Here's something to wake you up mobile spam in this society where everybody is using cell phones and broadband now outpaces desktop spam in Korea. That's something that uh, we're going to have to start thinking about. What happens when the spam actually goes into your pocket and not just onto your computer screen? Location-based services. Uh, we use GPS systems here to track all sorts of things. Uh, over there, they're building land-based location systems, which are terrestrial, which means that you can track people as they walk through buildings, as they go through subway systems, and other things. So uh, there are all sorts of positive and negative connotations to that. Robots. Uh, I think robots are going to be the next big industry. Uh, we've already uh, started deploying uh, weaponized robots over in Iraq. Uh, but those are just a small segment. The market for domestic robots is going to be taking off, according to uh, a number of United Nations studies worldwide.
Korea is getting ready to deploy by the end of this year a new generation of service robots. Uh, they call them males and females. The males will be used as bank security guards and they actually have the capability of throwing nets over people that they think are, are doing suspicious activities. The female robots uh, entertain people, answer questions, and uh, do things like that. That's uh, part of the Korean culture. Anyway, I, I'm really well, so ha ha happily we don't have to go into that aspect of the um, the questions you've raised. Uh, our Congress beyond my, will. Our beyond Congress my capability, will. I'm certain as a moderator. Um, uh, Pete, I want to I want to follow up on on your Korean experience and and see whether there's something we can learn about what we should be measuring and how we should be assessing our own progress here. You you started off by by pointing out that 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 South Korea indeed has these sort of tremendous broadband services that are very cheap and fat pipes, as 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 techies would say. Um, and then what you went on to talk about were a whole bunch of other services and technologies, RFID, scanners on cell phones, uh, uh, location-based services, which to, to, to my understanding are actually uh, very much about uh, services that are kind of in the hands of end users or, or capabilities that, 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 that enable users to process information in, a, in perhaps a more sophisticated way. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, in some sense, what should we be measuring about ourselves? Should we be saying, well, uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, the, the, the bit rate to the home that, that Korea has? Or should we be saying, well, we don't have all those other things? Uh, where's, where do you think the growth is going to come from? I suppose this is, in some sense, a question, you know, does size matter uh, about, about, about broadband? Or are there other things that we should be worrying about that we should be assessing uh, as we think about our progress as, a, as an information society? I think one of the first things is to look on a governmental level. Uh, the South Korean government has made very clear what its internet strategy is and, and said, here are our goals for bringing broadband to the population in terms of bringing higher bit rates to the population. You know, they want to be at 100 megabits per second within five years. Uh, I know that there's a panel later on today that's going to discuss whether that's feasible here in the United States or not. But uh, one thing is, is, do you know what the United States internet policy really is. And uh, I think if we can answer that question next year, that'll be a measure of success. Another thing is, of course, uh, uh, taking a look at some of the figures that uh, Lee has found in his latest study about whether the trust levels of the internet are going to increase here. Because most people I talk to expect that as we become more uh, tied to the net for everyday activities and critical infrastructure tasks, the chance of a meltdown, a uh, internet Chernobyl type of event increased dramatically, uh, whether it's terrorist based or, or simply a suicide squirrel throwing itself on a transformer and knocking out all of the Starbucks cash registers. Uh, so we'd have to see if the level of trust comes up. I, I'm curious for uh, um, uh, either Lee or Richard's thoughts on, on the question of trust. Um, Lee, you said that, that um, some proportion of people who don't use the Internet uh, are, are staying away from it because there's something about it they don't trust. Um, that, th that, I think, raises the question both uh, what would increase their trust level, but also what makes all of the rest of us who do use the Internet decide that it is trustworthy enough? How do, we, how do, how do people in their normal internet usage decide what to trust? Experience is the uh, far and away most uh, determinant factor. The longer you've been online, the more experience you have, the more likely it is you'll encounter the people, places, and things that you can trust and build trust with. Uh, once people have taken the plunge and given their credit card information to make that very first online purchase, they are radically different internet users after that if they've had a successful experience. Uh, they, they are much more likely to do online banking, much more likely to do online auctions, much more likely to make airline reservations or stuff like that. As much as, as, as making the, the bet on broadband, making a purchase online and having it completed successfully is a good thing. Same thing with government services. If, if people have had a good encounter with, uh, with a government agency website, no matter what they were wanting to do, it builds trust in government. So, so, Richard, in this converged world that you're talking about, do you think we have to think about trust differently? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the most brilliant inventions of the Internet is, the, uh, is, is uh, eBay's feedback system, uh, which really allowed the community to, to identify and to self-rate 
trust. And there's ways of gaming it, and it's not perfect, but, you know, you look at the number of transactions, and, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a government policy that would have been able to enforce that kind of trust. To me, the, the, the essence of the Internet is still that it is a grassroots, uh, the, it's very, it's, it's still extremely uh, vibrant on the grassroots level, and it's still, a, in some ways, the, the thing that's best about the Internet is that it's bottoms up and that the barriers to entry are very low. It's also the problem because anything can enter. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of filtering that's going on. So I think how you balance that opportunity for innovation and collaboration that will let people solve the problems themselves and, and yet still filter out the really malicious uh, applications is the critical question. So, so Richard has suggested that people ought to be able to solve problems themselves to a greater extent. I, I, if I could, could transpose that into the spam debate, the suggestion might be uh, we should rely more on uh, collaborative filtering solutions, more on, 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 on user empowering technologies to help people avoid spam and avoid spyware. Is that, is that realistic? Are people going to, are people going to go that direction? Uh, um, ha, has, has, has the regulatory approach gone in the wrong direction? Uh, is there a way that it could encourage uh, that kind of behavior? It, people are just generally nervous about spam. Uh, what, they, what they say they like uh, about the more robust filtering in whatever form that occurs is that it, it, yes it does in many cases keep the worst stuff out of their inboxes. But then there's this little devil on their shoulder saying, but what about the emails that you aren't getting that you want to be getting? Or what about the emails that you sent off with the high expectation they will get into the hands of the people who cared about them that didn't ever make it? And so, uh, you know, users can't sort out whether it's collaborative filtering or, or more robust cooperation or government policy or stuff like that. Um, they are, are sort, of, sort of hopelessly muddling through. I think uh, we may be seeing the emergence of a bifurcated Internet where people might be willing to pay extra for a secure Internet that is filtered already by uh, various spam engines and that uh, uses certification to make sure that the mails are coming from the people who uh, presume to be sending these things. Uh, I know I would be willing to, to pay extra for a spam-free uh, situation. There's also a number of companies popping up, dozens and dozens, that are addressing the issue by authentication and certification of the mail systems. Also, this idea of reputation. Uh, in order to have a reputation, you have to have a, an identity to pin it to. Uh, so there's going to be pressure in uh, anonymity. Uh, I think anonymity is still going to be possible on the Internet, but with, uh, with sort of transparency. That you know that somebody is anonymous, and therefore you're less likely to trust them. Uh, so all sorts of things. I, you know, the government may want to get involved and, uh, and begin saying that before you can attach a computer to the web, you have to identify yourself in some way. Uh, I, I have one final question for our panel, and then we're going to invite some questions from the floor. So if you have questions, please uh, come to a mic. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Lee, whether it's from your studies or, or, or Pete, your reporting, or, or Richard, your, your thoughts about this. Um, one of the questions that I think, uh, one of the great expectations of, of the web was that it was going to be uh, this great democratizing medium that was really going to be a two-way, many-to-many medium. Uh, uh, and, and I can tell you from the perspective of, of, of those of us sitting at the World Wide Web Consortium looking at the, the technology available in browsers today, it sometimes feels like an awfully uh, one-way medium and that we've just kind of reinvented broadcasting somehow complete with advertising and everything else. Um, uh, is, is that, is that w what is people's experience of, of the web? Is it, is it really two-way? Are people really able to talk to each other and exchange information in a decentralized way? Or is this just another mass medium? No, uh, Internet users have a fundamentally different sense of this medium than television viewers or radio listeners. 57% of broadband users in this country have created content that they've shared online with others. They put it into the online commons in one way or another, where they're posting creation of websites, with blogs, with postings to bulletin boards, and material like that. And more importantly, even those that haven't done that have the expectation of it. They want government websites 
to have a, uh, the capability of responding back to the government. 38 million people have already gotten involved in, in lobbying efforts uh, online uh, to the government, and they the two-way interactive component of this is a, is a fundamental given that is um, a, that over time every internet user comes to appreciate. Yeah, I would say that if the internet ended up as simply another mass medium, it would have it will have failed to reach its true potential, and that the thing that really is unique and distinctive about it is that it is a many-to-many -many medium. And again, I think in Peter's sense, it's really the youngsters who really get that. Uh, where the distinction between a producer and a consumer really is, a, is almost like a meaningless one. Peter, question? China, <laughs> Al-Qaeda. No, no discussion of either one, but both are shaping the net more than the Scandinavians or South Koreans or even the USA. Um, How so? China is already on IPv6, and I remember going to a W3C event in Hawaii in May of it was June of 1995, talking about IPv6 and whether W3C or ITF would drive it forward, and we still have that dilemma of non-adoption in this country. We're band-aids on, band on IPv4, and it's really kind of silly at this point. Uh, China is promoting a different architecture for the net with more government control. Carlson Cox has been doing some work on this over the years. Um, as for Al-Qaeda, it's been the news lately that they are better at credit card skimming than even the best fraudsters, and they're using credit card fraud on the net to fund their activities. Uh, they certainly use the internet to communicate through chat rooms, websites promote their propaganda, beheadings, and so forth. Uh, so what innovative lessons can we learn from these ingenious cultures and enterprises which are very different than what we normally think about here in D.C. or Silicon Valley or Seattle or Cambridge or anywhere else in this country? So China. Al-Qaeda, why aren't they being talked about in this panel? So, uh, Pete Lewis, why, um, uh, how do you think the business communities in the U.S. and perhaps in the West is responding to what appears to be uh, growing interest from China, growing presence in, 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 in a variety of high-tech markets? Well, uh, one other Korea data point, uh, the Korean government just issued a survey saying that they expect China to surpass them in technology within two years and uh, to make a run at the United States within the next five or six years uh, in terms of overall technological superiority. Uh, I don't know how they measure that, but uh, it's clearly a significant thing that China is uh, moving into the web so dramatically. On the other hand, uh, China has particular political uh, restraints on the web, uh, censorship, who can get on, monitoring of that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see how it develops into uh, internet commerce and everything on a global level. Al-Qaeda, uh, I don't know. Anyone have anything to say about Al-Qaeda on the panel? This is have not you surveyed Al-Qaeda? This, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is not responsive to the question, but it, it, there is something a lot of Internet users, uh, one of the things that they appreciate about the Internet is they can get material um, from places that are not necessarily well covered, well understood, or well represented in the mainstream media. And one of the most effective things that Al-Qaeda is doing is putting out uh, images that have a presence online that are attracting a, certainly a global audience, but a portion of Americans are going there too, not necessarily, not at all as recruits or, or uh, innocent folks that are being uh, swooped up in the, in the net. But um, it is, the, the, the connecting point between China and, and Al-Qaeda is, is the notion of sovereignty. How are we going to apply sort of existing political and social and economic structures that are well represented and make rules and norms that the rest of us can live by to this new environment where so many norms are scrambled, where the basic rules of etiquette and reputation and trust are all up for grabs again. I just want to make one quick point. Is, is we did invent the Internet, in fact. I mean, we, we did do that. We don't own it. And it is now a global issue. So, I mean, it's not just China and Al-Qaeda. I think we have to really, I, I mean, I, I think we have to keep reminding ourselves not to be parochial and to think of it in a global context because it, it is a worldwide web, indeed. Thanks. Uh, we, we have time for one final question, please. Um, yeah, hi. I have a question for Lee Rainey. Um, I found your remark about dial-up as a um, precursor to broadband use to be counterintuitive in many ways. Uh, and I'm wondering, because 
there are, there are a lot of broadband uses that are very easy, such as um, going into a Starbucks with your Wi-Fi laptop, opening a browser, and there you have it. And you could even argue that dial-up access is harder, quote unquote, than broadband because it's more frustrating, it's slower, and, and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if your research pointed to specific factors which led you to draw the conclusion that dial-up was sort of an easier first step before you got to broadband. It's, it's, it's absolutely a function of the technology adoption curve. Uh, dial-up was more easily available to the current internet users at the time that they were first getting on than broadband was. It might be the case now that, they, that you can leapfrog um, th this generational uh, step by making wireless broadband especially available in places where um, it's hard to Like to Philadelphia, for example. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's um, if you look at broadband users, they need some, some level of experience. And, and up until a year ago, it was still cheaper in many places and most circumstances to get a dial-up connection than a broadband connection. That is now changing, but uh, the economics of it was also sort of pushing people first to the simplest thing to do, even though it was harder and even though it was more complicated. And over time, they were willing to uh, pay a little bit more money for the time savings and also sort of the splendor of the Internet. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I'd like you to join me in thanking this panel very much for their insight. Uh, Thank you all. Thanks, Mission accomplished. Thank you very much. We are on schedule now. We are going to call our next panel where we're going to get an international perspective on the state of the net uh, from a number of distinguished international guests. Uh, can that panel come up and we'll, we're not going to take a break. Uh, if people have to take a break, take a break and come back. But we want to move right into the next panel.